Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 312 for Monday, July 12th, 2021. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gap, the show by for and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, Paul Kent. I'm exhausted after this weekend. I, I played, <laughs> I, like, as I was doing the intro, I was like, I need a nap. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good thing, though, because I'm exhausted because I played two gigs, including one that got me home, not late, late on Sunday night, but. You know, I was I was home by like nine o'clock, but it was still it was a long day. We were there from I left the house at eleven thirty, so it was you know it was a long day. Of, that the one that was in some kind of um, foresty setting. So I the pictures they look cool. Yeah, so I played two gigs in foresty settings this weekend. Um, yesterday was the one that I would say is least foresty. Although yesterday was great. We they were, it was both bitter pill gigs, and yesterday was at this beautiful house on uh, beautiful property, really, I should say on a small little lake in Maine. We have lots of lakes around here. It's, it's actually quite wonderful. And they're, you know, most of them are just hidden gems and only known to the people that, that live on them, you know, or maybe there's public access, but, um, but it was a, a gathering of this fantastic family uh, that I didn't know that I knew, uh, but it was friends and family of uh, a friend of, of Billy's, uh, named Kit who passed away from cancer two years ago. So it was a memorial for her that we were playing at. And I knew that part of it coming in. What I didn't realize was that I had sort of met a lot of these people for different reasons over the years. And, um, and I think Kit and, and her husband had been at several bitter pill shows over the years mm. too. So it was, I mean, it was an emotional thing, even not really having known her, but, uh, but, you know, being amongst this great family, and, and all of their friends, you know, it was an emotional experience to be a part of. It's just hard not to let that sort of seep in and, and not that I didn't want it to seep in. It was, it was just a nice thing and we wanted to play. Yeah. yeah, it was good. Um, and so that was sort of in the woods. Uh, and then on Saturday we played at this place called hippie hollow. I had no idea what to expect going into this, except I knew that it was a not great and and somewhat long walk from where you could have a car to where the stage was. So I decided, we decided, all right, let's not do full drum kit. Let's have each person do, you know, one trip to load in and and go as sparse as we can. So, which was fine. We played uh, one, we were going to play one long set. We actually played two sets there because uh, it went over so well. And so, you know, we walk in and it's this mud path in or whatever. And, um, I think a few people, I was like maybe the third or fourth person, you know, coming down the path of my stuff and the, and the owner of the property, the owners of the property, I should say, were fantastic. They had little carts and stuff, including one gasoline powered cart to get the heavier things, you know, down to the, the stage that they had built. And we, I get there and Billy's just on the stage and it's this perfect little stage, like built into the bottom of this hill, but very much in the vibe of hippie hollow. Like it, it, everything was well done, but it looked rustic and it was rustic. It was just really well engineered. And I'm walking up to where the stage is and Billy's just on the stage playing his, his cello, which he plays as a bass. He's, he's our bass player, right? But he plays it on a cello and, uh, and he was just talking and the mix in the house, the PA was already set up. The mix in the house was just perfect. It sounded like somebody had close mic'd everything and EQ'd it and compressed it and just made it sound delicious. But I knew that that didn't happen because Billy was only about, you know, 40 feet ahead of me on this, this path. So he had literally just pulled his, his cello out. <laughs> and I'm like, like, I'm trying to reconcile this and it's outside. So it's easier to get sound outside and, you know, all of those things. I mean, it's it, different challenges outside, right? But you're not going to deal with like a lot of feedback and stuff generally outside. And, uh, and I look and there's two microphones live on stage. I'm like, okay, what's going on? And I, I go up to these microphones and they're these Earthworks mics, SV33 for anybody that wants to know the model of them. Uh, and I'm like, this is amazing. Cause it's like, it's picking up everything but it's almost like it's pre-mixed, like it's it's evening out the levels. And, and it turns out there was no compression and no EQ, no nothing on these things. They were just like run basically into the speakers. 
and um you know, no distortion on the edges, but they've got this sort of really wide, like, you know, almost 180 degree pickup pattern. And they were just picking up the stage in this wonderful way. And so I mentioned that to the, this guy, Aaron, who was uh, one of the owners of, of the property. And he's like, I'm like, really, those mics are really great. He's like, Oh, thank you. He says, I appreciate you saying that. He says, those, those have been my baby. You know, I, I designed those. I'm like, aha, okay. Like th things are starting to come into focus a little bit here. And, and he's like, yeah, he says there, you know, uh, he's, he's been at earthworks. It turns out for in, in various capacities for like 20, over 20 years, right. Involved with earthworks. And, uh, and he's, you know, that's what he does. He's, he's a microphone designer. And, uh, and he was telling me all about this microphone and, and how it's the, the casing of it, the casing of the windscreen that really sort of defines the pickup pattern and, and all of that stuff, which I never really knew. I thought it was more about the element of the mic. He's like, no, 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 no. He's like the, the mic that's in there is just a regular, you know, condenser mic. I mean, he's, he talks about it. Like it's, it's not a fantastic microphone. Right. <laughs> but, but it's a, you know, the element is just like whatever the, probably the best element that they have is he said, but no, it's all about this thing. He said, but yeah, we're end of life them because, uh, they're a pain in the ass to make. They, you know, they've, they've only got, it takes like a human being, like an hour and 15 minutes to assemble one of these things. There's no way to do it on a production line. He explained to me how the glue needs to work and you got to like dip it and get it just right. Otherwise, if you screw it up, you got to start all over again. He's like, I did the first 150 of them myself. I'm like, okay, all right. I, I, I get it, you know? And it was amazing though, to be on stage and just play and just sing into the air and just have it sound great. And we did wind up getting a little bit particular. Of course, you know, being that he's uh, affiliated with, he works for Earthworks. Uh, he had other microphones. So like the banjo, we decided just more because he, the way we were set up, there's six of us in the band. He, uh, Mike, our banjo player needed to be a little bit further off to the side than the microphones would pick up. So he's like, Oh, I've got this directional mic. And you know, he aimed that at the banjo and it was just like, you know, oh, it's sung into the thing. And, uh, but it was fantastic. Like I didn't have a mic on my pitch slap. In fact, none of the mics were even aimed at me. And yet it just somehow magically picked it up. It really, I'm not sure how this mic, how these microphones worked, but it, it, it felt, I mean, they were condenser mics. So inside it would probably be a disaster. You know, you get all kinds of feedback if you gained them up that hot, but, um, but they just, they just, they replicated the sound to say that they replicated the sound accurately is correct, but probably doesn't explain quite how special it was <laughs> got it yeah so these are these are twenty four hundred dollar mics that's correct <laughs> that's right yes yeah i missed that but, part i meant to say that that's well no i mean i i mean i i don't think that that changes the mm -hmm. the positioning that you've kind of shared is that you know when you want when you want to as as people try and find interesting places to do streams or recording or broadcast and make it feel and look as natural as possible. You know, you know, a lot of people just set up a phone and let you go with yeah. the phone. And then yeah. a lot of companies now have, have created microphones that connect to a phone. This was and, the know, microphone that you described wanting last year. You're like, I just want to set something right. up and just have it sound fantastic. It's like, right. But, but what it's going to sound like is wh whatever environment you're in. So the environment needs to sound fantastic too, right? Like if, if you've got a reflective studio, this is probably not the, the yeah, yeah. yeah, it's probably not the vocal mic you want. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, but that's cool. It was amazing. And I've heard, I, so I mean, Earth, yeah, I mean, the, the way that you said it, we were just singing into the air and then all this magic is coming out of the PA. That's really quite cool. That's quite cool. Yeah. yeah, it was, It we were saying, or I was saying that it was, I, I the way we set up, I just happened to be standing between Emily and Billy, our two main singers in the band. I'm definitely, you know, singer number three uh, in the band. And then, then that's as it should be. They have like, I mean, they've got father daughter harmonies going on, right? Like you can't beat that. And, and they're both great singers on their own too. But there's a lot of songs where, you know, the three of us sing together, or maybe I'll just sing with Billy or, or whatever. And, uh, but we haven't had, it's been a while since we've even like attempted to have a vocal rehearsal. We've just kind of been evolving things. And it was the best vocal rehearsal we've ever had because I just, we, you know, I got to stand in between the two of them. I had this perfect stereo mix, mix that was perfectly natural. 
and I could blend and find that, you know, there's a couple of trouble spots where it was like, I'm not quite sure. I know that there's something I can fit in here, but you know, in the cacophony of, of a normal gig, I'm not really able to find it. And so I would like back off or, or even, you know, sit out for those passages and, and being able to do that at that moment in, in that was just fantastic. It was like, Oh yeah, all the questions are now answered for me. I'm good to go. And, and we, we all left that gig. Like vocally, that's the best we've ever sounded. And so it, it brings to mind a kind of an interesting concept. So I had, uh, I want to tell you about all four gigs that I played last yeah. weekend, but, yeah. but uh, two of them, which were solo acoustic gigs, I was playing through a big PA, like a really, like, like the PA was covering a really big distance. Mm -hmm. right? And um, so go on this little journey with me because you're talking about almost the freedom from amplification. I mean, it you was, know, it were, needed to be amplified. Don't get me wrong. There were a lot of people there, but, right. but like, we didn't have to alter. We didn't have to think about it when we played, right. we just played. But, and well, this is what I'm happened. saying. So, right. so I'm playing, you know, as I've shared with you, I love my bow system. It, it always set, always sounds good. Sure. Uh, it is, it is almost a, a, a safety blanket for me now. And even uh, on these gigs with the with the big PAs, I use my Bose as my personal monitor. Sure, but which is what those things were built for, by the way. But you know, right? Yep. Uh, but it is an interesting uh, point of stagecraft uh, playing through amazing PAs that that you feel in your performance. So imagine, you know, one guy on an acoustic guitar, right? I am literally feeling every nuance of my voice go out there without right. having to push. You know, you know that, and that, and I think that's one of the things about non-professional singers is we hear, and we're trying to adjust to a sound, a tonality, a pitch that um, that makes us, you know, feel good. Like, right. You know that that is is good. But but when a really good PA is making it incredibly easy, and it's not about air pressure in singing, or when your acoustic guitar, you know, like. Playing acoustic guitar is hard in live situations mm -hmm. often because it gets either lost. a yeah well and and if it's getting lost it's really hard to finger pick because it's you know you're trying to finger pick heavier or you strum harder and that typically pushes you know you, it often will get you into clipping and and it gets too percussive and you know so the nuances of playing you know good acoustic music is hard if sound reinforcement isn't right yeah. or, or actually the converse is really easy and pleasurable when the sound reinforcement. Yeah. You get right. used to the, the former and then you, you can enjoy the latter. That's right. Right. And so on these two gigs, I, um, I was just consciously constantly aware that, um, my performance was, was leveled up just because I had to do so much less. Yep. You know, I just literally, I could just do. And once you feel that confidence that, that the nuances and subtleties you know, you, it changes what you do. So, so you learn to perform on big PA systems as well. It's a different mm -hmm. skill than small bar gigs or small restaurant gigs, right? It's a different set of, uh, you have a new set of tools at your disposal when you, when you've got really good sound reinforcement like that. Yeah. But it can throw you off too. I mean, if you're not, if you're not aware of how, like how a big system is going to push whatever sound you're making out there, that can throw you off too. You, you know, if you're, if you're used to over strumming because that's the only yeah. thing, you know, yeah. uh, th then you're not letting the system do the work. Right. And so it's, it's that it, it really is just experience saying, okay, today we can like ease off a little bit. We can be, we can play in our comfort zone, even yeah. though, even though we don't normally play there, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it comfort zone might be the wrong term, but, but it is the right term. So, yeah. yeah. All right, so I will, I'll tell you about my gigs this weekend. So, um, and I had an interesting four-day road trip. Okay. Uh, the first gig was a cool gig that I picked up that kind of splits my drive up to the Bay Area from down here up. So it mm. was in Salinas, California. So a, a friend of mine who's a booking guy in the Bay Area knew that I had relocated. And he said, hey, you know, do you ever come through town? And I said, heck yeah. And so this was like a perfect first. So, I, you know, it, it turned my 3 a three plus hour drive into about a hour 45, two hour drive. And nice. uh, I, I pull up to my first gig, right? So Salinas, California, it's in the parking lot of a, of a stadium where they hold the rodeo. And uh, I pull up and 
there's a sound guy there. So they told me he's sometimes there and sometimes not there. So this oh, is, that's awesome. getting, <laughs> yeah. So, so I brought my, my PA in case, but you know, he, he was there and I'm there and he is blaring mariachi music. <laughs> I mean, so this is like a little farmer's market and it had, um, you know, maybe 10 to 20, uh, people selling farmer's market things and 10 to 20 food trucks and a couple other miscellaneous things. And it was an, it was a community, you know, farmer's market anyway. So it was one of those experiences where you pull up and I'm like, did, do they know what I do here? Like, you know, is James, is James Taylor and Cat Stevens going to follow the mariachi music really well? So, like I said, I get there, I get there early, you know, because I have the time and I just, you know, didn't know what to expect. So, you know, got there about an hour earlier than I would have pull up and the mariachi music is blaring. <laughs> and so I'm like, well, you know, in for a dime, in for a dollar. And so, uh, you know, I set up, you know, he, I, I did set up my bows for my own monitor. He took the out from that, and, you know, you know, he didn't have as much mix control, but, sure. but he took the out from that and, uh, it did, it sounded great. Um, it was, you know, it wasn't a hugely trafficked thing. You know, some people would grab some dinner and would sit down and listen to music here and there. People were really generous with tips, which was really cool. Um, and it went fine, but it was one of those, you know, like you pull in and like, you don't know kinds of music, country and Western, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah both kinds. You, know, you, just, you just don't know you both kinds. So, uh, but it was, you know, I, I was reflecting on the experience like, well, this is kind of what I've signed up for. Like if I'm going to be traveling minstrel guy, you know, these things are going to happen. So let's just lean in and, uh, and play your ass off. Yeah. And, embrace and it. Do the there you go. Can. Yeah. And it, it ended up working out well. So that was my first thing. Went home. Uh, I stayed with a buddy up in the Bay Area, and I was going to be at his house for the next uh, four nights. Uh, next day, um, I had a solo gig, 106 degrees at Downbeat. Um, yeah, it was a really, really warm uh, summer afternoon, uh, early evening, and stayed warm. Another great PA, another great sound guy, and that was fun. But um, I was feeling it, man. Too, you know. And the funny thing was, I left my house, and it was like. 80 degrees. It was about 53 degrees in Salinas for the first gig and then 106 degrees for the second gig. So again, yeah. we're, we're all over the place. Yeah. And I'm really, I know I've got four days ahead of me. I'm really cautious about my voice and, you know, very conscious about singing with good technique, you know, to be able to sing every day. So yep. we got a lot of things going on. And, and, and again, the context of all this, Dave, is, is I am just keenly aware that there are people who have been doing this road stuff, unexpected situations for years and years mm -hmm. and years. It is work. It, I it, mean, it is. it's not, we're not, we're not mining, you know, for coal. It's not that type of work, but it, it is its own unique set of stresses and it's not, and, and, uh, and circumstances that a professional has to find their way through. Well, that, you know, when I say that if you call me at 3 PM on the day of pretty much any gig and tell me it's canceled. You're my favorite person in the world. Uh, and it's not, obviously it's not because I don't like playing gigs. Right. I mean, if that were the case, I, I just wouldn't do this anymore, but it, it more is exactly this is there is that unknown, even going to a club that I've, or a venue, I should say that I've played before. There's still unknowns about that particular day, but especially going somewhere new, it's like, okay, I got to get there. You know, first of all, I got to get all my crap in my car and and make sure I've got everything right. You know, and and you all know that I I fret about that with my OCD, and so I have my my checklist and all that. So, but you know, I got to go do that, and then I drive to the gig, and then you get there, and it's like, what's it going to be? You know, you have no clue, yeah. no clue, and and that there's some fun in that once I'm sort of in it, but. Right up until the moment, usually it's the moment that I, it's certainly by the time I'm set up, I'm good to go. But even once I like step on the stage or whatever we're calling the stage for the day, that's when I start to feel like, okay, like a lot of the unknowns have gone by now. You, you know, I don't like the, the anxiety of the unknown is, is quickly diminishing and I'm starting to formulate, okay, what can I do here to make this work? You know, whereas if you don't know, you don't know. Yeah. And it is, it's work, but it, even once you know, you still got to solve the problem every time. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and, and solve the problems and, uh, and have the ability to clean the slate so you can come and do the job you are hired to do. Right. You That's know, correct. So. Right. It's not, your job isn't to solve the problems, although that, that <laughs> right. actually is the job, right. But the, the job is, as you said, to entertain. And so it's, 
how do I solve all these problems so that I can let go of all the problems yeah. and entertain? That's right. Yeah. Right. So, all right. So day one, follow the match mariachi music day 206 degrees. Um, I'm staying with a friend who's very gracious and wonderful hospitality. I don't know if you, you remember my buddy, Richard Karras. He was I know Apple Richard. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Richard, you know, has opened his home to me. He said, anytime, you know, he's got a pool. So I, at the end of the 106 nice. degree gig, you know, I got to cool down a little bit. And, and, uh, we had some great chats about music. It was, you know, it, it was nice. I missed being away from my wife, but it was, but it was really nice. Yeah. But I woke up the, the next morning and my body was like feeling it for whatever reason, right? And I had a house rocker gig that night. And so now I'm kind of reflecting on, you know, Jesus, you know, of all the things that I can control and can't control, you know, now I, now there's a physical element to what's going on. And um, and I kind of was this with a lot of stretching, you know, kind of did a roller on my back and, you know, yep. all this type of stuff and, you know, got myself in pretty good shape. Uh, got a chance to drive up to this gig, about a, about a 40 minute drive from where I was staying with Russ, our drummer. And it was just great to have the time with Russ to connect, you know, and, I, and this stuff is important. Like, do you ever drive to gigs with band members or are you al almost always by yourself? Um, it, these days it's almost always by myself. The one thing I loved about the Murray Woods band, which was the blues band that I played in, in Austin, Texas is we were a trio and two of us lived almost in the same neighborhood just by happenstance our bass yeah. player and I, and then, and then Murray lived elsewhere, but he would come down and we would load one truck. Uh, and three of us would sit across the front of one of our pickup trucks because we all had pickup trucks and we just load the stuff in and go to the gig. And it was fantastic. Uh, just yeah. being a band in the car before and after the gig, it, you know, like that, I miss that. That was great. I, yep. Exactly. So that time was just great because you know, we've, we've had a couple of rehearsals, we've had a couple of gigs, but you know, that time, 40 minutes there, 40 minutes back, I, I helped Rody for him. So he appreciated sure. the help of getting his drums on and off stage. Um, you do know, you not do that he, all the time. Like is your band not a nobody leaves until every cable is wrapped kind of band? No, oh. everybody, everybody's for themselves, right? Well, you that know, we have sucks. a little crew for the sound system. It does suck. And because um, there's bonding know, there too. Like I, I, and, and as the drummer, certainly, you know, I appreciate the help, but it, it's more, uh, and I do appreciate the help with my drums for, for sure, but it's more about that. We're all in this together thing. And, you know, with the PA and all of that stuff, like the PA can take it, it, it longer to break down than I would with my kit. If I was just doing it by myself. So we have a crew for PA. So we sure. pay that, but you know, yeah. Nick has got a lot of heavy stuff. Yeah. Russ has got a stuff. Right. And you know what? I don't, I, I would actually say this is kind of a moral failing of our band and it's probably just more habit now than anything else. Yeah. Right. And I think, you know, some of it is just what, what guys are used to. Sure. And so, but, but, you know, I help out on occasion, you know, and, and jump in. And I'm, I would imagine that the guy who I help out with at any pick in time is like, why do you do this sometimes and not all the time? You know, it's probably yeah. the obvious question that would come on someone's mind. But anyway, so it is what it is. Uh, you know, Russ and I, I help him get on, help him get off. We have a nice drive home. Kind of debrief on the gig was a lot of fun. And just I felt it was a you know, good bonding thing. When I had, you know, a late night bad dinner uh, and then went back and well, get ready for. Those are some of the best dinners. <laughs> exactly. And then my fourth gig was um, another solo acoustic gig. And, and it's a gig that I have turned into a regular gig in the town I used to live in. Um, it's kind of cool because. It's a finite amount of space for seated. There's, you know, standing room. And the proprietor of the place uh, has started selling tickets for people to come see me. It's interesting to me just because it's a point of reference. Like our people are willing to see this cover band musician, you know, kind of do this thing. And she sells it out. The last two that we did have sold out. I did this one with our buddy Chris Breen. So, Chris, nice. if you're out there, love you. It was great to see Chris and our first connection since uh, since COVID. And uh, it, it was just a really joyous gig and a very high way to end a, a great four days. Got up early on Sunday morning, Joe home and, yeah. you know, have been kind of glowing over the whole thing. But man, what a range of emotions. Like you said, problem solving, the unknown, um, you know, a very conscious effort to get into the zone so you can perform and, you know, deliver and, you know, meet your own expectations or yeah. exceed your own expectations. All that kind of stuff went into this four day trip. And I'll get to do it again in another two weeks and I'll get to do it again in another couple of weeks after that. 
And so um, different than just having local four days, you know, because yeah. there's the whole, am I going to run into traffic? Am I going to run into the stress of being late of, over something I can't control? You know, just all the kind of mis the mysteries of, of having these things be as seamless as possible. Yeah. I, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about that setup thing. And, you know, again, I, I do this as often as I can. I've got a bill and I wish on everybody in the world a bill because Bill, our sound guy, um, gets to gigs early. He'll call me if there's any unexpected things sure. whenever there is. And so I kind of have like a, I kind of have like a lead blocker, you know, for <laughs> so many things yeah. Yeah, yeah, when yeah, it yeah. comes to house rocker gigs that, you know, I, it, there's so seldomly surprises a he handles so much stuff in advance right he's just such a blessing i mean it literally you know could an adult 10-piece band with the amount of gear that we have to get somewhere and you know you're we're not always playing gigs that that would pay a rate that would allow us to hire a pro sound company or pro sound and lights mm -hmm. right so to be self-contained in this way yeah. allows us to take advantage of different things and again i i wish a bill on everybody he's you know someone who loves music, loves the band, loves being in a band in this way. And, and just like I said, he's, he's like an all American lead blocker. Who's just always out in front clearing the way so we can do what we love to do. No, that there's a smart, there's a lesson there for, for everyone. Like if you're, if you're building a band, build it with a, like we, cause we do this with uh, uptown celebration was built that way. Right. Where Dave, our sound engineer, uh, is just a member of the band, right? And so building a, a sound engineer into the band that mm -hmm. <laughs> that is not a playing member of the band <laughs> uh, can, like you said, it comes with, a, you you bring yourself a lot of flexibility. I suppose that, that flexibility is there if you are able to do the sound yourselves, right? Like even without an extra person. But that's harder to do, uh, you know, to do what I call the Braille mix where you're not out there hearing and you just kind of have to set it up and go. But, um, but yeah, if you can be self-contained when you have to be, that's, that's huge. That's yep. huge. Yeah. We, I, the, the whole setup and tear down thing, I have, I have found that I lose interest very quickly in bands where it is just about show up, plug in, play and leave. And part of that is, you know, th there's some level of resentment, right? Of like, okay, well, you know, I got all this crap here. Like, <laughs> this is what it takes to put on the show. Your yeah. crap, my crap, his crap, her crap, right? Like, and so this is what we all want to do for the show. Let's all be in it together. There's definitely some level of that. But the other part is the camaraderie of it. Like, if we're not getting there together and setting up together and tearing down together and we're just playing music together it it starts to get a little weird and and bitter pill is in an interesting spot with this because there's a couple of people in the band that have never played in bands before and then there's you know a few of us that are like you know lifelong people who have played in bands and yeah and it and so like we're in a weird spot and everybody is on board with the camaraderie everybody is on board with helping out but it's not ingrained in all of us at the same level, right? Like if you, I think if you asked everybody in the band, everybody would say, oh yeah, we all help. We all, but that's, it's there's like, that's not necessarily true that like not everybody helps at an equal level. And there definitely isn't a vibe yet. We're, we're getting there. There's not a vibe yet where the, you know, nobody leaves until there's a clean stage. Uh, and I, I leveraged that on Saturday. You know, we had that gig where I just brought my pitch slap and a bag of like percussive toys and things in, and uh, as soon as we finished the gig, I looked at my watch. I'm like, oh, you know, I my original plan before we got the gig was that I was going to go in, uh, with Lisa and Sky, my wife and daughter, to see this uh, Eagles tribute band, the Dark Desert Eagles, fronted by Pat Badger, the bass player of Extreme. He plays guitar in this band. And our, and our friend Chris Lester plays the Joe Walsh part. I'd never seen him before and I've heard good things. And so we had bought tickets to go see him in, in uh, Hampton, New Hampshire, at the casino ballroom. And... Uh, but then I got this gig with Bitter Pill and I was like, okay, well, you girls go off and have fun and, you know, you've got an extra seat next to you. Enjoy. Mm -hmm. Bring somebody if you want. But they didn't bring somebody. And I looked at the clock and they had texted me saying, oh, there's an opening band. And, you know, the timing was going to work out that I would probably only miss, you know, 10 minutes of the of of the set from this Eagles band. I'm like, you know what? I'm going. Like, that's it. And so I grabbed my stuff and left. And it was the weirdest thing. Like, it was really hard to get myself to leave. Uh, you know, without everybody else having packed up and us all not having done it together. 
And yeah. uh, I mean, I asked everybody, I'm like, are you okay? Like, is this like, everybody's like, well, we all only have our own stuff. Like, it, yeah, go, it's fine. There's nothing to do. I'm like, yeah, but it just feels weird, you know, to be the first one leaving the gig. They're like, take advantage of it. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't like it. Like I, <laughs> I didn't like it. It was, it was very convenient based on schedule. Right. But if it were, if I did not have this, this event, I definitely would not have been able to bring myself to leave, but it was like, all right, I'm not going to see my wife all weekend. Like I, I can, I, okay, I'm going to do this, but I was not happy about it. It was, it was very interesting. I'm still conflicted about the fact that I did it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's an, it's an interesting thing that, that whole, you know, all for one, one for all kind of attitude that, that I think is a really good thing for a band. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't disagree. It's hard to, it's hard to, if you don't start out with that philosophy, yes. it's hard to, it's hard to inject that philosophy. It right? is. And I think the, the and I, I'll tell you horn, horn players, oh, you know, yeah. they just, that's not the way they think. They're like, I, I, that's I not, all my that's not universally true though. Cause I've played, you know, we've had horn players, even just people that sit in with the wedding band and they have like stayed till the end to get everything wow. out of there. Yeah. It's not, I mean, I get what you're saying. Like, and even with like theater musicians of, of which I am one, like the first theater show I did, I packed up, you know, at the end of the run, I packed up my drums, I put them in my car and, uh, and then I came back in to help out. And they're like, what are you still doing here? I'm like, well, mm -hmm. you know, we're tearing down the show that we all just did together. They're like, yeah, but you're in the band. You should like, you just worry about yourself and leave. I'm like, yeah, it's like, really difficult to do that. So mm -hmm. I'm going to help for a little while until, you know, until I feel all right leaving. And they're like, okay, you know, here, here's a screw gun. Go. I'm like, okay, great. Sounds good. You know? Um, but bitter pills so, getting there. I have hope for bitter pill because everybody shares the mindset. It, it's just, you need to learn what it actually means. Right. Like, and, and do it enough so that it becomes practice. And we are, we are getting better about it, which is good. So, cool. yeah. Hey, I, um, I, I want to close the show with a little talk about the big change that's going on in my band, but I have been dying to hear what your magic word is that you teased me about last time. <laughs> So I have, I have a question for you. Maybe that's the best way to, uh, to start this topic, Paul. So if you'll allow me to ask you this question, when was the last time you wore a costume? Uh, we had a Halloween gig probably three years ago, I think. Okay. All right. So I, I would, and I, and I think that would be the answer that I would have given probably five years ago and maybe even two years ago. But I will argue, I will posit, not argue, I will posit that every single time we put on clothes or don't put on clothes, we are wearing a costume in that we are putting on, you know, we are dressing ourselves for the environment and the occasion to which we are, you know, bringing ourselves, right? And it might just be, I'm around the house today, so my costume is, you know, <laughs> sweats and or sports shorts maybe and a t-shirt, right? But if you're going to a business meeting, you're putting on a different outfit, aka a different costume. And it's a very intentional thing, what you're putting on your body, the clothes you're choosing to present yourself to whatever audience slash environment that you're in. And so I would say, when we get on stage, we are wearing a costume, whether or not it's something that you would say is stage gear. And I'm not saying you necessarily, but I'm saying all of us, you know, in the, 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 the general you is sort of irrelevant. You have chosen that we have chosen that as our costume for that particular gig. And I think it's really important to think about it from that mindset, especially for those of us that wouldn't necessarily want to stand out all of the time, like in life in general. And that's um, go ahead. So are you, are you getting to the word? Well, that's it. It's costume. The, the word costume. is costume. Yeah. Got it. Like, all right. So interesting. Um, let, let, let's, Let's get a little existential here, right? Yeah. So you could argue that uh, human beings, certainly musicians, and wherever those circles may cross over, um, uh, everything we do is a expression of what is either our comfort zone or our aspirational brand. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Fine. If you, yeah. if you if you think cargo shorts and flip flops are your costume, 
you're saying, yes, I want people to know. I mean, what do they want to know? That, uh, you know, I'm not about... I'm not about shiny front ends, you know. I'm all yep. about the music. I mean, this is what you often hear, you know, when musicians don't don't place a lot of value on 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 dress. I I I think though, like there's nothing wrong with choosing cargo shorts and flip flops as your costume. You know, I'll I'll point out, you know, Jimmy Buffett, Sammy Hagar, right? I mean, these are people that have had huge success with cargo shorts and flip flops on stage. All right, right? Wait, wait, I got to pause you right there. So don't okay. forget what you're going to say. Okay. I have a tremendous issue when you point to the gross, the most obvious pieces of, of success in those things. You're not Jimmy Buffett, right? You're not, unless you are Jimmy Buffett or Sammy Hager, you have a hard time saying, well, it's good for Sammy. It's good for Jimmy. So it's good for me. Are you doing musically what Sammy or Jimmy Buffett are doing that you can actually, you know, See, walk I, that walk? I, I, I reject the, <clears throat> I reject the premise in what you're saying though, because I think, I think most of the people, and I certainly, you know, I, I can speak personally from the people that I, I work with. Most of the people who are adamantly in the cargo shorts and, and flip-flops camp, and this could be said about any dress, right? But most of the people that are in that camp are not accepting of the fact that that is their costume for the day. They are not looking at it that way. Whereas I would guarantee that Sammy Hagar and Jimmy Buffett are very much choosing that costume to wear on stage because they know it's part of their personal brand. They want to project this certain image. I think most people who choose cargo shorts and flip-flops have an anti-image. Like they, they are not thinking about that. They are presenting an image on stage. I think they feel like, and, and this is again from conversations with people. So I'm generalizing based on specifics and the plural of anecdote is not data but bear with me here. Allow me. <laughs> uh, but you know, they, they are, they are choosing cargo shorts and flip flops to not be seen on stage, right? It's not that this is how I want to be seen. It's I don't want to be seen. And so I'm just going to wear what I use to mow the lawn today. And that's my way of saying it's about the music. It's not about how I look. Jimmy Buffett and Sammy Hagar would never tell you it's not about how I look. Uh, right. They are right. selling I'll, a vibe. They I, are. I'm, I'm with you. Right. I'm with you on that. Yeah. yeah. I'm with you on that. However, uh, I don't think that it's an accident. I, I, I think that the, you know, the person who's, who dresses a certain way, you, you are, you're making a choice. I mean, well, even, yeah. the, the, absence, the absence of a choice is still it's a choice. Still, well, that's what I'm saying is we have to accept that whatever we are wearing when we stand on stage is our, our chosen costume for that gig. And I think that if there's one lesson I want to sort of impart, it's that, that whatever you are wearing, whether you've chosen it or it was an accident or it just sort of happenstance, that is now your costume for today. And, and, and you need to, you need to accept that whether or not you like it, that's your costume because the person that shows up in the crowd and watches you sees you in costume. Yeah. Yeah. And interprets things based upon many factors, including your chosen costume. Yeah. 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 They don't know what your thought process was during the day. They don't know that you mowed the lawn. They don't care. They're, They're here to watch you. your brand. You, 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 what's your brand? Okay. That's it. All right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And my point would be more, I think often I find the circular logic about musicians perspective on this as opposed to their goals, right? right? Right. That's it. Is it, does your costume serve your goals for Jimmy and that's, Sammy? Heck yeah, it does. <laughs> right. But if you're, if you're a cargo shorts band wondering um, why you're not getting, you know, invited to play pre presidential inaugurations, you know, there's a, there's a cognitive dissonance there. That's pretty <laughs> right. loud. Yeah. And that, that, that's actually more what I react to. Like I, I, you know, I don't care actually when I go see a band. I mean, while I, I appreciate professionalism um, and I, I pr appreciate um, preparation, um, mostly when I read these threads that actually get pretty heated about, you know, iPads on stage and cargo oh, shorts sure. on stage, yeah. 
you know, people are, have a lot of really strong opinions about this. I don't, I don't have an opinion about cargo shorts on stage, you know, just to be clear, because you're right. I, I probably chose the wrong, the wrong thing because that is such a hot topic on, you know, when people want to fight on the internet, I right. like, I, I'm not telling people not to wear cargo shorts. In fact, I'm pointing at two examples of people that have massive success in their lives who lean in and fully embrace cargo shorts, right? Like yeah, they yeah. may be the reason that we still have cargo shorts, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's what I'm saying is like they they are selling you on a lifestyle when they hit the stage. It's not just about the music. They are saying as opposed to as opposed to the semi professional musician correct. who who is uh, the abs feels as though the absence of selling you on a lifestyle doesn't understand that you're still selling someone on a uh, you know on a choice. You are always selling a lifestyle when you are out there, and whether it's at a business meeting, a cocktail party, like your neighbors friggin' barbecue, whatever it is, man, <laughs> you are, no, you are sell, doing a podcast. Any podcaster that's out there that doesn't think that they are selling their lifestyle to the people that are listening is lying to themselves. I am not wearing cargo shorts while doing this podcast. Uh, yeah. My shorts have no cargo. Uh, I mean, they have regular <laughs> pockets, but you know, that's how it, but seriously, like, you know, here we are, we talk about our, our gigs and the, you know, the mic, sometimes we talk about the microphones we use even for the podcast and how fortunate we are that we can work from our homes and this, that, and the other thing, like, that's a lifestyle right there. Whether you, whether you know it or not, that's a whole other story, but yep. that's what's, that is part of the package. It's not the only part of the package. Like there's a lot to it. Hopefully we're sharing valuable information and, and, you know, making you think and inviting you to participate feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Right. But the whole thing, it's a package. And I think that's to, you know, me, I'm, I'm like keen on developing my, my own sense of self-awareness. And, and this has been a part of it is like just accepting that whatever it is you happen to be wearing, that's your costume. Yeah. Like it or not. <laughs> yeah. You know, it is a choice. Yep. It is communicating a message, you know, and I guess the, the useful conclusion to that is, does that message support your goals? That's it. And that's all that's, that's the question to ask. And yeah, if cargo shorts is it great. If suits is it great. If, if Jimmy Buffett walked on stage wearing freaking Beatles suits, that would look like that wouldn't fit anymore. Right. Right. So uh, it, it, it'd like, be hard to sing songs about margaritas in, in, in beetle boots in beetle boots. Correct. Yeah. And that's okay. But just know like, what's the full package, the type of music, you know, the way you present yourself, just the way you carry yourself and, and, and the, your clothes, you know, I cool. think so. Yeah. Good points. I want to, I, I like want to, um, I want to share one thing and then I want to hear about your, um, I want to hear more about how things are going with, with your bass player leaving your band after so long. Mm -hmm. I have this chafe gig coming up on Saturday night at the gaslight here in Portsmouth. And it's the first time chafe has played in like six years. So there's a little bit of anxiety about, uh, you know, are we ready for this gig? Of course the answer is no, but we're going to do it anyway. And you know, we we're all, everybody can play. Everybody knows how to listen. We all trust each other. Many of us have played in monkey fist over the years. So it's like that part's going to be fine. And we've also played this club many, 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 many times. I've played this club, you know, probably 50 times over the years. We were sent a, policies guide by the club and there was no the policies guide is just here's when you must start here's when you must finish here's how long your sets will be it's like it's a very regimented thing you know you must start your first set at 7 p.m you must end your third set at 11 p.m please yeah. please keep all breaks under 30 minutes uh no parking in the back alley parking is available you know anywhere on the street that you can find in portsmouth new hampshire which is impossible uh and or the parking garage, which is sort of nearby, but not really. Uh, and then loading of loading and unloading of equipment. Uh, no equipment can be stored or placed anywhere other than the stage. Please do not hide equipment underneath the back stairway or block aisles. If it cannot fit on the stage, it must go back in your vehicle. This is new. I understand, in fact, why every single one of these things, and I didn't read them all, uh, is on this sheet that they sent to us. But the problem is, it comes with, it be, and the reason that they're on here is because bands have, have been idiots, right? You know, some band shows up, they leave their gear all over the place. They, they're not aware of like the flow of how people need to walk and move at the club and it gets in the way and causes problems for the staff and the patrons. And that's not good. Right. And, and probably there have been bands play, that played there that were, you know, dickish about this. Right. 
Putting these policies out there, though, especially the first time you're playing this year, you know, here you go. Here's the, here's the policies sends this message of antagonism, right? It's like we are here and, and thou shalt not break our rules or there will be a fight, you know, this whole thing. And it's the wrong message. That's the wrong way for this club to deliver the message. What it should start with, in my opinion, is, the, you know, starting with, hey, we're not assholes here. If you're not an asshole and you come and we're all going to work together to make the night a success, all good. However, if you decide to be an asshole, we have this list of policies for you to follow, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, like, like, because I know, I know the people at this club. I know that that is their intention. At least I'm assuming that's their intention. And that's how I'm going into Saturday, right? Like nobody's showing up looking for a fight. If we're all, if we all can collaborate together on making this night a success, we're going to make this night a success. But having these rules where it like literally is saying you need to set up and then cart your, you know, drum cases and instrument cases throughout the myriad streets of Portsmouth back to your cars after you, you know, have unloaded and parked and, and now you've set up. It's unrealistic, right? That's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But it's like, okay, we get it. Like, and we've always gotten it. Like, of course you can't put the cases in an alley or in a, in a walkway. Like, duh. You know, th these obvious things. Not, but, it's not duh to everybody though. Yeah, but think. that's the, that, but that's the thing is the message doesn't come across as this stuff. Uh, over the years, we've learned this stuff isn't obvious to everyone. So <laughs> please work with us. Like there's none of that in this. It's just this like, you know, there will be changes. And and that doesn't read well to me. You know, I, I, don't, yeah. I don't tend to like that kind of thing. So when I first saw this, I was like, you know what? I, I'm just not going to go. I'm fine. Find another drummer. I was like, no, this is not what they meant. So let's back off a little bit. Let's assume that they meant what the way I think they meant it. And let's just yeah. go have fun. I don't know. It's just, it's just, well, boy. So <laughs> you actually have kind of given me a really good opening here. So I'm gonna, the first thing I want to relay about this new change to my band life yeah. um, is we have a friend of the band who had always expressed some interest in playing. Um, enough guys in the band have played in other things with him to know that and, and know about him that he's a real deal. He's a good, he's a good fit for, for at least a, 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 medium term subbing sure, situation. Sure. And Which is really that, what you needed out of the gate with this. I mean, we said, I know well, we said this last I, I'm week, gonna get to that. Yeah. I'm gonna get to that. So but here's a funny thing. When we replaced our drummer, I was trying to mitigate a bunch of things. Like there were a couple other opinions in the band about other people who might be good. Sure. I felt pretty strongly about Russ. Um and so I I said we should we should do auditions. And let everybody listen and everybody and everybody, you know, have a, have a voice. Um, that process blew up in my face bad. A, oh. poor, poor Russ had already played five gigs with us, right? Like oh. we knew what he could do. Sure. Um, and, the, and one of the other guys had played one or two gigs with us. Um, and then there were a couple other A-list players in the area who had expressed some interest. And I said to them, well, we're going to do auditions. And they were hugely pushed out of shape. Like, you've seen, you know what I can do, right? So it became almost this kind of like social hand grenade, right? And, and you know, I'm really fortunate that Russ stuck it out with us because he, it was not right. I mean, a guy with his reputation and he had played five gigs with us, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I bungled that not out of, you know, it was an act of, of omission, not commission. I wasn't trying to be a dick to anybody, but, but I was, I was trying to give the whole band, I was trying to give everybody who had an opinion about, you know, other drummers we should yeah. hear. Yeah. And where I was, what I should have done is just, you know, we had enough information. I should have just got get the band together and, you know, just say, do we want to bring anybody extra in addition to the other two that we have? And let's just talk about this. Here's what we know. But, you know, the whole process of asking for uh, auditions push people out of shape in different ways. So yep. as soon as you really ask somebody, that. as soon as you ask somebody for their input, they now are committed to the output and they want, yes. they want their input yes. to be seen in the output. And that's a really hard thing to do as a manager. Uh, yeah. I, like, yeah, we've had episodes of the small business show at business show.co about yeah. that it, for that reason. Like it's, you want the input of your team but like somebody needs to make the final decision and yes. th like th that's a really weird balance to deal with because everybody wants to make the final decision. But yep. 
nobody necessarily wants the responsibility of always making the final decision. <laughs> right, right. All right. So now we get yeah. to this. So this second, you know, major change to my rhythm section in five years. And um, I had felt very strongly that one of the things I need to do is, is I need to be a more definitive leader and, you know, tell people how this process is going to go instead of ask people how it should go Sure. and, and define where people's input could be for this type of thing. Right. Yep. Again, not, it's not a full democracy, but my style is to, you know, give enough buy-in where people feel connected to the process, right? Yeah, and, but, and actually oh, have them connected to the process. That's right. Yeah. yeah that's what you don't so, just want to do it for show. Like you, you actually want connection, but still everybody understands what the, the, where the decision is going to be made. Yeah, exactly. So um, what I said was, is that we're kind of in triage mode. We've got a lot of gigs coming up. You yeah. know, we certainly aren't going to have a big, long discussion. we got to get someone in and get ready. We talked about a, th a few people who, you know, could possibly be it. But, you know, this one guy who, again, has been a friend of the band, has played with different guys in the band. He um, had the right resume and, you know, we think it'll be, uh, you know, the best fit. But I said it needs to be, we need to approach this as a, as a sub situation, we can't, you know, just, Hey, someone's leaving the band, you know, issue an invitation. You want to join the band and right. someone who's never played with the band. Right. Right. So it's a long-term sub. We've got like 20 gigs on the calendar. And so I can guarantee the person for the time in to learn our show, you'll get 20 gigs out of it and, right. you know, pay and that type of thing. And if it, you know, if it's clear that it's gelling for both sides, yeah, we're open to talking about more stuff. But right now the only conversation I want to have is I'm offering a sub situation and I was, I tried to be painfully clear about that. Um, I wrote a thing that was kind of like things I wanted someone to know, almost to have something in writing to avoid any confusions, right? And my first pass at writing this, and this is kind of like your your club that sent you something. I wrote something, I just kind of <laughs> brain dumped everything I needed someone to think. And I showed it to some of the guys and Nick said, you know, what you're saying is right. But it, I kind of, if I was to get this, it feels like, you yeah. know, the law offices of Dewey, Jeetum, and Hal. Right, <laughs> right. That's the problem. And, and he like, goes, yeah, I understand he, why you wrote this, but only because I took a breath after I yes. read it the first time. And so Nick, you know, yeah. said, write it on a much more conversational tone, yeah. you know, be a little bit more self-deprecating about the stuff. And so, I, you know, I, I rewrote it a couple more times and kind of smoothed it, smoothed it, smoothed it. But it was stuff that should needed to be said. Like there's you know, nothing wrong with saying it. No, that's the point. Is like you've yeah. learned your lessons. Not <laughs> not all of them. Hard. Yeah. You, you will learn a new one through this process that you can't think of. But you know you've learned enough of them that it's worth getting it out, getting out in front of it, and and you know making it a collaborative effort to avoid the problems you know have happened in the past. Right. Like yeah. that's the key. But but I think probably if to, to crystallize what Nick was trying to say is you need to make it sound like it's a collaborative effort, <laughs> not, yeah. not like you said, here's, here's the, here's the legal letter. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, after a couple of iterations, I got it down. I, I'm, I sent it to the guy who's, who's a good guy and didn't hear anything for a couple of days, checked in any questions. He goes, Nope. Appreciate the spirit in which it came. I, I'm guessing it's still, despite my best efforts, might've came across a little bit more stringent than, than the uh, initial effort. I'm kind of okay with it because like I said, everything in there had to be said at the end of the day, he's going to come, he's going to play with us. And that's going to be the essence of our things. Sure. You know, I don't think that this is going to form the base. I mean, he's known most of the guys in the group for so long. So yeah. I, you know, I'm kind of okay. You know, if it had a little bit of a, of a, of a rough edge around it, but the stuff didn't need to be said. And so here we are. So, you know, now I, I've got a, a great sub I've, I've, Stop the bleeding. You, you know, we've yeah, you solved the problem. a problem. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, the reality is if assuming this guy can play, which I think is, al is already a known, right. And yeah. assuming he knows how to be in a band that there's a really good chance that all of you will decide to continue this thing long term. I, I mean, like momentum is what it is, right? You get through it, even 10 gigs, let alone 20. It's just the chemistry thing now. That's I think it. It's just like, does it gel musically and socially? And, you know, we are a band that social is a part of our, you know, it's not just guys who just right. show up at a gig and, you know, perform their duties and go home. It's a band that hangs out together, that dines together. You yeah. know, that's that's part of why it's been together as long as it has. But is honestly, that, you know, what you did is you took, in my view, you took the pressure off, right? Because, 
here's this guy coming in. He may not like he knows some of your guys, but he may not like the vibe of your band. Like he doesn't know. And, and I mean, he can he knows what he sees from the outside, maybe. And you don't necessarily know. And so you've taken the pressure off for that. Everybody knows that, OK, if we get four gigs into this thing and we realize, OK, like this isn't exactly who we would want to have in the band or this isn't exactly the kind of band I would want to be in. Well, that's fine. There's 16 more gigs. They're all going to pay well. You know, I, I know what they're, or at least I know what they're going to It's a business pay. relationship. It's a business relationship. And you know what? I mean, like you could, you can get through that. I mean, I'm not expecting yeah. that you're going to have like, you know, <laughs> brawls amongst the members or anything, but you know, everybody knows that there's no pressure. It's not like, oh my gosh, like this guy's are this is really the guy. Like yeah. we're going to be here for five years. Like there's <laughs> nobody, nobody's asking that question. In fact, you've given yourselves the opportunity to say the opposite. Like, Wow. I'm sad that we're only doing 20 gigs together. We, let's talk about maybe, you know, making this a, a more, a more regular yeah. thing, right? Like, but that's, that option is open to everyone. It's not forced on anyone. And that's, that's it. Beautiful. So the lessons have been learned. And, yeah. you know, I think that this is a sane process for our situation, right? That's right. Um, so that said, you know, I just kind of want to close here today. And um, I have this incredibly dear friend. Uh, who's going to be moving on. He's, he's moving out of state. Um, he was, he's the longest tenured member of my rhythm section. He's been with me for 20 years. Wow. Um, I remember the day he came to my house and we played together, te technically an audition. Sure. Um, he, he prepared, he was interesting. He was clever. He was funny as hell. Um, very different than any human being I had known. He is the first musician that I ever met in my life who taught me that lesson that they, that like, you know, some of these guys are wired completely differently. I mean, he, he really is one of those guys who it, music is every fiber of his being. I mean, he practices all the time. He's constantly looking for creative ways to express himself. He, he's not a nine to five guy in any way, shape or form. He lives and breathes music, sacrifices for his art and, you played with him and he's absolutely yeah. oh, he's, 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 he's a player. pleasure to play with. He, yeah, he, he, whenever I needed a shoulder during those gigs that I played with you, he was right there. It was no problem. He, you know, yeah, it, yeah absolutely. Great Loves guy. other musicians. Yeah. You know, you start with Steve on the bait, not like, you know, show me what you can do. You start with Steve. He's like, Oh cool. You're here. You're playing with us today. Uh, the assumption is you're one of us, right? And That's he's it. that guy who gives that, that thing off. He's taught me so much. In our band, Steve was the um, officiant, right? So uh, whenever we had a technical problem, you know, like like something from a theory standpoint, a horn chart standpoint, a, a groove or rhythm standpoint, Steve was the trusted, informed soul who would navigate us through always with like a, a, a velvet glove, very encouragingly, you know, just really remarkable guy. He's... He drinks hard and, and he lives hard. Um, and somehow or other he channels all that into his music. And uh, he has taught me so much. He's so different from me. We had him over to our house for uh, a Thanksgiving one year when he was a single guy. And he enjoyed, you know, being around a family so much and just mm -hmm. to watch this guy get away. To me, he's, you know, he's kind of, at that time, he was, he was pretty hermit-like. Like, like he was either practicing or gigging was his entire life. And to get him out of the house was a pretty weird thing. And just, uh, he, you know, he and my daughter bond over books. Um, he's incredible intellectual, really. You know, he was like on, on a path to a master's in um, philosophy, I think, when he stopped going to school to pursue his music. And... Just one of the most interesting, unique cats I've ever met in my life and has just inspired me so much to just, you know, he made me stop and think that I don't know as much as I think I know, right? When it comes to people, when it comes to situations sure. and, you know, just made it so easy for me to, you know, learn to experience the process of making music with other people. I mean, that, that's kind of what he sounds like a fantastic was. teacher. Well, yeah, and he's a teacher, right? So yeah. he was a he he taught um, special education kids, you know, kids with oh, motor skill yeah. issues, elementary school level. He got fed up with red tape and processes surrounding the official way of of being a teacher in a public school, and has been a music teacher for kids as long as I know him. So That's yes, great. just I you know I just want to take a moment to thank my dear friend for 
20 years of lessons and music and brotherhood and friendship and love. I, I can't express, I don't know. He listens to this every once in a while, so I don't know if this will get to him, but, but, uh, uh, in this relationship, Steve, you know, I received way more than I was able to give and just I'll always be appreciative. And I know Michigan is getting one of the greatest bass players I could ever imagine. Yeah, that's you know, for sure. Coming there, yeah, he, so. no, he's a great player. He's one of my favorites to play with for sure. Cool. He, he and I approached groove the same way. And uh, it was super comfortable just sitting down and playing with him. The, even the first time it was like, like you said, he, he doesn't start with the, he's not an excitable guy. And, and so like the first time I played with him, I'm like, does this guy even want me here? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> is, is he aloof? Is he aloof or is he ignoring me? Right. You know, and it's just, no, he's just like low key. It's not even that yeah. he's aloof. He's just low yeah. key. And then it, you know, very quickly, it became obvious that he was very warm and welcoming in this low key way, which was fantastic. Yeah. And then, and then as soon as you start playing, it's like, aha, okay, got it. I see where exactly where we are. This is great. No, nothing is left to, to, to guess here. Like we're going to play, which was great. Yeah. Yeah. So onward we go. Onward we go. Folks, thanks for listening. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Send in your thoughts about your costumes, your uh, antagonistic club policies, your magical microphones, whatever it is. We'd like to hear from you. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. You got anything else to add, my friend? Just always be performing. That's it, man. Think about about the great musicians in your life because nothing's guaranteed to be together forever. So enjoy it while you got it. That's a great place to leave this. 